Thundergrunt. Blockbusters, the show where we treat the final edit of a movie like a script. We're going to introduce ourselves. Go ahead, guys. I am Jimmy George. I am a script consultant and screenwriter. My Twitter handle is at Jimmy R. George. And I'm Jamie Nash. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I am the author of Save the Cat Rights for TV. And my Twitter handle is at Jamie underscore Nash. And this is my new radio voice. <laughs> and I'm Bob Rose. And I am actually friends with the guy who wrote Save the Cat Writes for TV. <laughs> my Twitter handle is at Thundergrunt Bob. Hi, guys. Uh, today, we're going to talk about... Hi, Bob. <laughs> Hi. You're breaking up hey. a little bit. But we're, we're already hey, breaking Bob. up. That's, the, that's part of the, uh, yes. the bingo card. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh first before we get started we're i'm gonna say we're gonna say a thank you from the show directly to uh one of our super fans michael rusk who took the time to make a writer's blockbuster bingo card that he posted on twitter right yes <laughs> and i Which think I we've already knocked off two spaces on that oh already. yeah definitely <laughs> like we have I'll, I'll just read a few of them here there was the uh, uh jamie mentions nickelodeon Bob asks, explain what that term means. Uh, I read an amateur script five days a week, which is for Jimmy. <laughs> Mentioning Blake Snyder, Jamie saying, um. <laughs> uh, many years ago, I attended this seminar, <laughs> which I believe is a Jimmy one. Star Wars references. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I like this one for Jimmy. It tracks, man. It tracks. It tracks. <laughs> <laughs> and of course uh me saying move your mic closer to your face <laughs> there's more but we won't have to read all of them but yes. oh jamie mispronounces the name i like <laughs> <laughs> so thank you michael russ for uh yes giving us some love it's yeah. an honor it's an yeah. honor yeah like tear us apart that's only we, we consider it a, a compliment yeah absolutely mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah but uh today we're going to talk about the Duh. suicide squad Duh. Duh. <laughs> Duh. very important the suicide squad i think it's still available on hbo max right guys mm -hmm. it's like yeah. only for a little while though i think that's what i watched it on so yeah that's that's what they should have named that recent halloween reboot it should have been halloween. the halloween the halloween how about just halloween 2018 uh anyway anyway <laughs> yeah like titles uh, yeah i don't mind the, i don't mind adding a the that much but it's confused a lot of people <sighs> Yeah, it really did. There's a lot of people on my timelines who were like, so is it a re-release? <laughs> they don't people don't know. Um, is, it, is there something thematic about like because of the way that movie opens like this is the Suicide Squad? That was not the Suicide Squad? I, I don't no, know. No, no. I, so I think it was just what James Gunn wanted. WB let him do whatever he wanted and he was okay. fine with that, I guess. Right. Um. Before we get into our discussion topics, let's all talk about what we thought of the movie outside of just the script. Did we enjoy uh, it? Who wants to go first? You want me to go first? You want, How about I go first? I'll get my shit out of the way. Yeah, get it. Get it, Bob. Even though yeah. I think Jamie's the mystery card here. We're waiting because we, me, and, me and Jimmy already know how we feel. Um, I obviously loved it. I've told you guys let yesterday I watched it for the show and that was my sixth time watching it. Wow. So I've seen it six times recreationally. I've also been home for about three months. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not that weird. Cause I've got a lot of time and a lot of alone time since the fucking COVID thing, but I, I really love it. Um, it's probably, I would probably put it in my top, uh, four James Gunn movies, top five. 
you know, not that that's a huge filmography, but I definitely right. love it. It's a lot. Has, it's got a lot of stuff. Six for movies. Me. <laughs> yeah, he's six <laughs> movies. Now he's got like in my 10. top five. <laughs> I'm including stuff he's, he just wrote too. I'm including stuff he wrote. Um, yeah, but I would I put it in the upper half of James Gunn movies uh, for me, and it's just you know, <clears throat> I my I wish I could have seen something like this in a theater with a lot of friends. Yeah, yeah, it and would I play think, well, and I think it would play all the better for me even and for other people who might not have had as much not even you, jimmy but i think like you know like if you had that first impression of the movie mm-hmm. it would play better for a lot of people because it was meant to be seen like that and it's right at home is not how this was supposed it's to not be the same i watched it by yeah. myself in a small room <laughs> right right <laughs> yeah right right um yeah. but uh so i'll go and we'll leave jamie's mystery to the end um (laughs) i am not in love with this movie like pretty much everyone i know is and uh i think it's got a lot of really fucking awesome parts like individual parts and i think it's like really rewatchable but i think like on the whole it's kind of messy is what i'll say i'd agree with the rewatchability um but yeah (laughs) so that that's what i think I can objectively say there's a lot of craft on display and I can appreciate that craft. But on the whole, if we're just talking about screenwriting, because I'm just talking about screenwriting. We're not talking about that, though. Not yet. Yeah, I love love, love the direction and all that and all the the show. Yeah, yeah. and the performances. But that's irrelevant to this podcast. This is a screenwriting podcast. And from a screenwriting standpoint, I think it's kind of a mess. Yeah, there. Visit us on our, you know, uh, Writer's Blockbusters <laughs> nights where we talk about just cinematography and acting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, you're keep, keeping us in suspense. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that was a great episode. Thanks, awesome. guys. <laughs> awesome. That That's what that. <laughs> I decided I'd just try to wing this one and see if I could get away with it. You just watched the trailer and just kind of wrote it yourself. And then <laughs> that's right. There's a, I glanced over the Wikipedia. Yeah, um, that's all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I kind of fell in the middle of both of you. Uh, so I have a man crush on James Gunn. He is kind of the guy I've always wanted to be, like all through his career. I've always wanted to make movies like he does. They're kind of send-ups, but have heart. They're not quite <clears throat> spoofs, but they're not quite totally serious. They're, they go in outrageous, jokey places. I, I always love James Gunn in general uh this movie does have its parts where in the beginning of it i started to check out a little bit at home like it just started Mm -hmm. to lose me a little bit and then by the end it regained me and Mm -hmm. by the time we got the project starfish and it all paid off and everything i actually quite liked it so it was a weird movie in that it took me a little while to to kind of grab me Uh, so you know it's a mixed bag for me it's not like a number one with a bullet but definitely i enjoyed it and i enjoyed the james gunn kind of stuff that Mm -hmm. that went on with it so yeah like for me i'm i also he's one of my heroes too jamie and i kind of enjoy like the spirit he brings to stuff because he comes from that trauma life you know what i mean and i mean the guardians movies are very clean Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm Yep. And this was obviously him. also like we haven't even said it. This is him making a movie when he was probably at one of the lowest points of his life, mm-hmm. you yes. know. And so maybe that messiness kind of it reads too mm-hmm. because of what was going on. I don't mm-hmm. know, but I kind of like that about it, you know. I like yeah. scrappy stuff. So yeah, yeah. Like to me, which I said on the show before, I uh, I think there are good movies with bad scripts. Mm-hmm. Oh, and I'm not saying like, this yeah. is a bad script at all. No, I'm not. But I'm just saying in general, like I've said this on the show a few times, like I definitely love a lot of movies that don't have good scripts <laughs> like because mm-hmm. scripts aren't movies. There's they're two separate entities. I, I He didn't do this, I don't think at all. But it, this almost reads like that type of script you have lots of cool ideas for and you almost, you know, pantsing is the word like you don't really outline you just kind of keep going and then yep. this happens and then yeah, this yeah. happens mm-hmm. and you got all these cool ideas and you jam pack them in and it's kind of awesome uh at, in some ways and it feels less like the one that you agonized over the script for months and months and mm-hmm. months and prune this and prune that and fixed and then mm-hmm. it went through a committee and all, all that lot- stuff streamline mm-hmm. streamline stream yeah it's so, not that so it, it definitely doesn't feel like that and i think 
I think that's what you're reacting to a little bit, Bob, is that you like it for that. And I appreciate it for that too. I like, re- I like kitchen sink movies. Yeah. I like, I yeah. like when a movie feels like it's doing 900 things all at once and punching me in the face. I, <laughs> so, I, I've, I've kind of, like that guy. I've kind of written both scripts of my own at times where yeah. I've written ones that are just a blast of every creative, <laughs> cool, funny idea I could think of. And I didn't censor myself too much. And then I have the other ones where I overly censor myself and I kind of prune. And both of them have their merits, I think. I think the perfect script feels like this one, but is the other one. You know, it's like, it's, and that's probably what Guardians is. You know, it's yes. probably, it yeah. probably feels like, like it's just some crazy burst of creativity. But then at the same time, it's, it's mathematically perfected. Yeah, Guardians is so well crafted. It's, it, right, uh, right. Yeah, it's just a different beast. Right. He also yeah. probably, he was in it, obviously at a different part of his career when he was writing guardians mm-hmm. right you know you could yeah. argue too guardians 2 sort of lives a little bit between both of these movies yep. yeah definitely it it yeah. walks that line and guardians 2 is still pretty much my favorite mcu movie yeah you know? i love it like, i yeah. do love it right but okay so we just completely answered who wrote who pooped out this script <laughs> <laughs> yeah we didn't we don't need to really cover that because because we got because we were because of the uh, bingo car we don't want to say i who shit this movie? Yeah, <laughs> Who wrote this shit that's right. I, I'm avoiding no bingo for you, Mister Rusk. Um, right. No. Uh, so the other thing I didn't do the box office for this one because oh, that's weird. I'm at the I'm at the point when they come out on HBO Max and because there there were a lot of articles like Suicide Squad bombs, you know, no, and it's it like didn't, though. did a it's on HBO Max. I mean, yeah. Come on. Give me a break. Yeah. So. And and people talking about it like it's a normal like people that didn't like it. Like Jimmy over here. No, <laughs> people that didn't like it are like saying it it bombed. And I'm like, this is a circumstance that it doesn't matter. Box office doesn't yeah. exist as it was. You can't judge things as it were. Like Shang Chi's coming out in a week only in theaters. We'll see how that does, but I'm not mm-hmm. gonna say it bombed if it doesn't make money. People mm-hmm. are scared. <laughs> yeah i don't know what you, what do you want it's and not it's normal like, it's like 25 million free guy makes 25 million dollars but that didn't come out on hbo max so who right. knows what that would have made if it came mm-hmm. out on hbo max or something so and it's 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 very it's just an odd thing also it's a sequel with the title that's almost identical and the see and the original while it made a, like a lot of money i don't think i think the years have been unkind to it as far as even the fans when they watched the first one so maybe that had something to do with it I don't know. Uh, apparently, though, I did see, I did read yesterday, it was like the most watched comic book movie on HBO Max. And they do have all of WB. So that is yeah. like a big deal. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's a big deal. Well, so. it, it's, it would shock me that it beat Wonder Woman 2 because that was such an event coming out of Christmas. Yeah. The long awaited. So if it did that, that, that must be pretty impressive. Yeah. Right. And. I just can't. I'm just not going to hold it against something for not making a lot of money at the box office anymore. Like that part of our podcast where we talk about that is kind of dead for a while. Yeah, we should just kill it for like, yeah, like until it's the pandemic is <laughs> under wrap, right. you know, control. Yeah. That's my segment, pal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, That's we're, fa- we're phasing we're phasing Jamie's opinions out as, as slowly, but we're sure. trying to prevent people from getting bingo. Um. <laughs> Okay, uh, then. Well, then Jimmy doesn't get to do rooting resume anymore. <laughs> okay. Dude, if we rooting, remove, the, rooting if we, if we remove all the bingo card, we won't have a show anymore. Yeah. <laughs> That's the entire thing. Bob, no more telling us to move our mics. <laughs> At this point, it just sounds like a Zoom call, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, so, yeah. Let, how about let's just start from the beginning. Yeah. The, the opening, which is, I mean it's a it's a fake out it's a it's a, that's a huge mm-hmm. deal right the entire it's not just we're not just talking about the onslaught we're talking literally from the moment savant shows up to when, when the twist right jamie i want to talk i want to hear your thoughts about the, this uh this particular use of in media res do you want to introduce in media res kind of for anyone who's not familiar with the term i'm not so pleased to it, it really just means i mean it's fancy word for saying st- start in the middle i guess yeah you know? yeah well it's a, it's a strategy for when you start your movie yeah jump jump in you know jump in on a, i i call it 
I, I know I've called it in the past, like a moving train, like start the moving train. Don't show the train starting. Start when the train hits 60 miles an hour mm -hmm. and then, and then hop on board the story train, the story train. Woo woo. No. <laughs> That's <laughs> my new podcast. Come on, ride the train. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, start on that moving train. Uh, this, this one kind of does this thing. I almost feel like it's a reaction to the first movie where he kind of gives a condensed version of the first movie, you know, yes. in the beginning where you fly through the, you, the prison scene where they're all coming together and they're meeting each other and they're on the, on the airplane and they're flying here and they're doing that. And they do it all in this quick, tight package. That's, that's really fun to watch. And my favorite thing in this whole movie is what is it? The disc, what's the guy the disconnected oh the, yeah the, uh the um tdk tdk, TDK. No, nathan no, fillion yeah that, that was Who? that was my favorite thing in the whole i think it was yesterday uh james Gunn did a live tweet yes. thing on twitter while watching the movie and he mentioned that it does not show he is dead so okay. if so it's possible we could see tdk again okay i hope so <laughs> Pro probably yeah. in the peacemaker or Peacekeeper television Peacemaker series. television show on Peacemaker, HBO Max, yeah, right. That's probably where it'll show up. It'll be a buddy show. Um, so anyway, a starting, you know, starting fast, that moving train, it's a great way. I actually suggest it, especially for spec scripts or TV pilots. I think it's, it's so much better than starting. You know, the worst way you can start is the old, the alarm rings or, or whatever. And we wake <laughs> the up the alarm clock, man. Uh, yeah. the, the old alarm clock thing. Uh, I think there's a lot to learn from this opening and how fast it moves because when you're writing scripts, I, I can't even emphasize how important those first five pages are or 10 pages. So if you can start with something and show how good of a writer you are, how creative you are, how interesting this read's going to be, and just show the reader how, you know, confident you are and, and give them confidence in you and and what they're about to read it goes a long way to the rest of it so it, uh, in this specific this case too jamie what you said like it's a response to the first movie mm -hmm. i think it's a response in that the we're not talking about the first movie but people dying was not a thing in that movie right this is called the suicide squad this opens up promising people will die Mm -hmm. <laughs> right hardcore it, it like, sets up the stakes for the stakes sure. are there people are going to die viciously and fast and you're not seeing them again right yeah and and, and that tonal scale uh which we we have as one of our things it mm -hmm. it sets up like the nathan fillion character like this is this is a movie that's going to have that kind of humor in it yeah uh, where mm -hmm. characters or characters in the movie can actually react to the actual tone almost yes <laughs> like there's like she says what the fuck is happening <laughs> right yeah 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 and also i i wanted to say it also established there's a lot of stuff it establishes too like the whole the opening thing it establishes you know like the like the head like the things in their head it establishes uh amanda Wall waller's char character a lot like right off mm -hmm. the bat like if you've never seen the first movie right assuming that you haven't it establishes her completely the fact that she's willing to do all this completely throw away an entire team right. yeah it's yeah. very immersive for yeah. sure like yeah. it's it's not just for the carnage it's there is a lot of stuff going on here it's it's almost written as a mini short story right you know it could be a short film it could be i i very i very much viewed this whole thing as like each chapter being a comic book you know mm -hmm, it's like mm -hmm. and you could almost see where this could be the first comic of a series that ends with um send in team two and then you get a picture of the actual team and that's the splash page and then you have to go to you know your second issue to get that in your right. six six or seven issue mini yeah we talk about these um, things often being like television now and it feels like a teaser um yes, it does you know your teaser for the tv series you're about to watch now the danger of doing this in a movie <laughs> the danger of doing it it's like a 13 minute sequence yeah and mm. and and this this is some of the stuff that may have lost me and we'll talk about this as we get going but the danger of it is then you have to go and do the setup of your main character <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what i mean so you're already 13 minutes in mm -hmm. and then we meet bloodsport and it's like hey who is this guy? Mm -hmm. You know, what are his, what are his yeah. uh, rooting? What's his rooting resume? You know, mm -hmm. what's his problem? Why does he have to do it? What's the kind of, you know, you still have to do all that stuff, and you're 13 minutes deep into the movie. Right. So 
That's, right. that's the danger if you're doing it yourself. And it's not so, it doesn't mean there's a rule against it or anything like that. It just means you have to kind of be aware that, that you have to be hella entertaining. And James Gunn <laughs> always is, you know, he's, he's the master of entertaining. Of I mean, he literally, he, when he, even with the introduction of, uh, Bloodsport, then they do the introduction of John Cena where the exact same dialogue is even said. You yeah. Know, it's like a repeat within a repeat. <laughs> yeah. And then yep. they comment on it, you know. I think why it works is because ultimately it's because it's consequential. Yeah. Like we're seeing them lay the groundwork for the team that we're actually going to be able to follow to get their mission going. Um, I I think if it wasn't consequential, like if if Harley didn't acquire the javelin, if I think if it wasn't consequential, it would be a problem. But like ultimately, like that for me is the most instructive thing about why this works is it's it's the events are very consequential to what happens next. What happens next? Um, it also has the like I like that it also has like it's you said it was like a short film. It also has its little arc of the bird in it. You know, like it has it, like it comes back in on itself and it could end there with the bird eating Savant's brains. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean, like it's it, got it, the book end. Absolutely. Like, it is like, a, yeah, you, yeah, you did write it like a little yeah. film. Yeah, my my only Jamie and where this is, I am. I have a feeling this is what you're tapping into. My only concern with it, and where where I will make my first Wonder Woman eighty four reference that I'll make again as we go along is um, the lack of orientation about what the fuck is going on um, intentionally. So um, is where I was like wasn't emotionally into it. Like I was enjoying what was happening, but like, I didn't know what the purpose was for the entire thing. And that's exactly what happens in the wonder woman opening. Like there's like a, there's like a 15 minute prologue of her as like a little girl doing this, uh, you know, this Olympic thing and you don't know what's happening or why it's very interesting. It sets up the world, but ultimately what is the purpose? And this movie kind of does the same thing. It takes another like 20 minutes after that to even tell us what we were watching. And that that's, that's my only problem with it. Um, I, I mean, I, I kind of, I'm not, I'm not here to argue about it, <laughs> but I, once again, I really feel like in those moments, I feel like while we don't know what's happening, it's still so rounding out Amanda Waller during it. True. True. I, I like, I, like, yes, I'm not, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. Like when I first watched it, no clue what was going on <laughs> at all but you know it is really saying a lot about her and what she like you got it's like her end of it is almost story-wise way more important than all yeah, of them dying on that beach that's a good point i, I never really, really thought of it that way i really feel like it is because without that what is she besides just the you know for the rest of the movie besides someone who threatens somebody 90 minutes later to blow up their head <laughs> yeah you know like it really builds her out yeah um that's yeah. a good point. Yeah, that's. I mean, but I agree. It, it, it's confusing as hell, but I feel like that's intentional. No, I know. It's I know it is. Yeah, it, yeah. It's a bit of a flourish, you know. It's a flourish. It's kind of like, do you have to do like a thirteen-minute beginning that you technically could have cut out or done something else with? Maybe not. But th this is what I mean. You could have like, just started with the introduction and then go to linear, right? You could have done that. Yeah, but it's it's genre premise delivery. We're getting all the genre <laughs> expectation boxes checked off. Getting like, those suicides. One, <laughs> af one after, exactly, one after another. You're getting your trailer moments. I mean, they could just have done everything in the trailer be from that and not show you they, anything they else. They did. And they would, it would have worked. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He, so. he, he does some things that, I really love when I see them, but you rarely see them because they're it. So just getting to the point that says, okay, send in team two. And then you show team two. And it's like that whole team didn't matter. It's, <laughs> it's, it's all a big joke, right? It's kind of like a, a, a laugh to us. It's a joke on us almost. And I love, I love that kind of stuff. Like another, he did a very similar beat when they, when they go through the jungle and they're killing all the people. Yes. The contest. <laughs> oh, and then man, it's like, yeah. And then when he goes in and it's like, these are the rebel freedom fighters. And it's just like, I love that. I mean, I think that's so, that's hilarious. Like that's, to me, you know, that's, it's that's also what makes like, it so entertaining. You're, you're cheering for them killing all these people because you don't right. know that they're not, they're good guy. Right. <laughs> right. And it actually fools it. It's a troll on you and us. Yeah. yeah. Which, like yeah. I was going to say for the opening, we don't know that Harley and Rick Flag are alive until it, until after, until we see Harley with the javelin mm -hmm. part. 
that's also like a direct i mean like he's he's fooling with us right like that's a direct thing like killing harley quinn would be a huge deal in that universe that's yeah <laughs> he just good he point. just glosses Faking over the kill it. yeah yeah Faking yeah. that kill yeah. the whole thing is is a setup well like, killing and, killing pete davidson was a huge <laughs> thing in that you know <laughs> they brought him back to have to throw toilet paper at Idris Elba. <laughs> That's right. right. That's right. But I was also going to say, like, <laughs> I wrote this down. Uh, there's a fake out in the fake out for me. I don't know if you guys saw this, but the way that it's written through the eyes of Savant, like, I kind of until his head exploded, I assumed that he was actually going to be the one that makes it. Yeah, we follow mm-hmm. the movie through him, the main but, character. Yeah, yeah, and then he blows his head up. It's definitely a false <laughs> protagonist. Yeah. yeah, like everything yeah. about this was a fake out. Like. And the, the fact that Michael Rooker is playing that part right, in the exactly. Gun movie is like, you're like, oh, it's Rooker. He's back. He's going to do the thing. And then they kill him off. In the yeah. beginning. He's, the whole, a t- yeah. he's a total scaredy cat and he dies like a punk. <laughs> like it, it's like completely the opposite of what he does with Rooker. Right? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So it's like James Gunn is he's trolling us. He's trolling people. I mean, in a good way. And in the suicide, the people that saw the first movie, you know, all this different stuff. He's just, he's, he's playing us so well uh, in the, in that opening that I kind of love the opening, but then I realized, Oh, now I got to go back. To, so you got to start like, another, movie, right? I got to do another <laughs> opening. And this is where it started to lose me just a little bit. Cause I really enjoyed, I love I've also I was also really disappointed that the weasel died so much because I was loving the weasel. I was like, this weasel, this weasel is awesome. And then the weasel died. I kind of wanted more Captain Boomerang to be honest. But, Captain Boomerang. <laughs> I might have liked the first team better in some ways, uh, but you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, it was also watching it as many times. I was like, this was supposed to happen too. Amanda Waller. These were all expendable people. She didn't care about mm-hmm. them. She basically viewed them all as useless, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. The, yeah. The, one, the one thing while we're before we get to blood sport and right. set up, um, tonal scale. This is a movie that is so sp- specific and difficult. Like if you're writing your own screenplay, how to maintain this tonal balance? It really is kind of something that not a lot of people pull off very well because uh, some people would go they they think they were doing this but then they go really serious and really like fart jokey that um this is probably me writing a script and then and then <laughs> it would just be kind of all over the place and as you were reading the script you'd be like what the hell is this um but he does a really good job so i wanted to kind of think about the tones tonal scale for this movie w- with you guys like let's mm-hmm. let's brainstorm the tonal mm. scale i Normally, I do it with Batman because Batman's the the one that has the most things. So it's like a Lego movie might be a two. So you start almost silly on the left and then you go to the right, which is or 60s Batman, maybe even 60s Batman might be a three. I'm not sure if Lego or 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 60s is funnier or sillier. I can't Lego is more meta. So maybe more meta. So that's why I kind of put it there. It's more extreme. And then I put three is kind of 60s batman and then nolan would be like at a nine nine yeah yeah that'd be your nolan the new batman. movie looks like it's a 10 10 yeah and, yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah and then the tim burton stuff depending on which one like might fall yeah. returns might, would be like five four or five five four or yeah. five and then yeah. and then maybe the schumacher stuff is one down from that yeah it's like you're like, a half a point down. like a four yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. strangely enough i'd put this in, if I was doing that scale, I'd probably put it in the Schumacher space. Yeah, but definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, would. No. I would too. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Because it has more violence, it's a hard choice. Um, yeah. And then it was like, then I started to do one in my head. What's the James Gunn tonal scale? And I put like mm. this, I put like the specials at like a two or a three. Uh, Man, a then, lot of people aren't going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> what yeah, about, where do you put Tromeo and Juliet? That's true. That's that's a tricky. That might be yeah. a three or something. That's a three. Yeah. I mean, he sort of lives at the bottom end of that scale, doesn't he? He does. I I put Dawn of the Dead like at the seven. 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 Something. Seven's good. Um, yeah. I don't Unanimous. Think eight or ten. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, but I think it's it's like somewhere in between Guardians mm-hmm. and Tromeo and Juliet or something. Yeah. It is. Where's Scooby Doo though? Well, <laughs> Scooby Doo probably lies around where this one lies. Four or five, right? Yeah. yeah. 
Right. Yeah. So okay. So Tromeo and Julia is like a three, <laughs> and and Dawn of the Dead is like a seven. So we're saying this is like maybe a four or five on that. Yeah, and then where does Super fall? That's what I'm wondering. I haven't seen Super. That's Super the one to me I'm... would probably be closer to seven or eight. I agree. It's probably more yeah. serious. It's, Super's it, the it, darkest movie he's made. It feels like it's in a more grounded world, even though yeah. it has its silliness Super, to it. Super is his taxi driver. Jamie, I feel like we just need to kind of recap for people who have never heard us use this tonal scale, like okay. what what we're saying here, like what, why we're saying it. By the way, if Bob said that, that would be a bingo. But since Jimmy <laughs> said it, I did write it down. I wrote down the Batman tonal scale on the no, thing. No, yeah. I mean to clarify a term. Yes. No. Oh, 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 yeah, you're right. So Jimmy did it. If you're scoring at home, no, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, the tonal scale is just something. If you're using one of these odd tones or you have trouble with tones, my recommendation is to write out a scale from one to ten of movies you've seen comp movies and think about their tone think about how silly versus how serious they are and and then kind of write a scale and figure out where your movie lies on that scale so when you're testing yourself you can kind of ask yourself you know where do i lie on my batman scale am i adam west or am i tim burton or am i christopher nolan and if you're trying to be a Christopher Nolan movie and you have an Adam West joke in there, you're probably in trouble. Yeah, cut it. Yeah. In, the, in the middle, it gets a little iffy. You might fall somewhere between. You might need to adjust your own scale. But if, if you have a problem with tone or if you get notes on tone, especially if you're getting notes back that say this, this is all over the place in tone, this is a trick you might use, like make the scale. And, and Jimmy even pointed out, and I saw this too, Jimmy, that there was what was the Netflix? Um, it was Pretty Woman's episode, the movies it. that made us. Yeah. Yeah. And they said, I think Disney had some, I, I don't know if they were really saying Disney had the scale or they, they were being the light. The, yeah. No, they, they were, they were playing it like this was the scale. The this lightness was the scale. scale. The lightness yeah. scale. Yeah, oh. Dis, yeah. Disney had this lightness scale and it was kind and of. That was back in similar. the early nineties. We're talking. Yeah. It was when they yeah. started doing uh, live action films and moving away from Probably animation. Touch, touchstone pictures. Touched, it was the touchstone pictures yeah. lightness scale. So, and they were saying pretty woman was at a, at a nine and they needed it to be at like a five. So, yeah. Cause, <laughs> cause pretty woman was originally like much more hardcore prostitution and drugs yeah. and things like that yeah. before they kind of lightened it up a little bit yeah uh, i was gonna I say what too, else fell if there. you don't want to use batman you probably could use james bond no it's just it's it's really your comparables right we're just using batman yeah. for an example i know so, i'm saying yeah. somebody at home maybe not familiar with batman you could probably use james bond like yeah totally there's like the james bond movies have extremely like daniel craig and then there's you know roger moore you know at like, least for understanding the tool it's right, really a right, tool yeah, right? right so like you yeah. when you're writing something you, you know what you're you know what you're going for right like you have your comparables in your mind two or three so so the idea is to take like two or three movies that you're trying to emulate right in style and tone and voice and you go okay these are the movies where do i fit and if you're coming up with stuff and it's like way on the nine and you're in a five then it doesn't work and you need to like change it so that it aligns with the rest of the five stuff and that that's really what we're talking about yeah this this exercise is fun to do with friends too. Absolutely. Like to debate, you know, is that a six or a seven? Yeah. It's kind of fun. For us movie nerds, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, but I imagine yeah. too, like, I mean, I can't, we can't get into his mind, but I assume when he's writing something like this, he's also saying to himself, like, what if I make the dirty dozen and I take the, the total scale and slide it? down to here you know what i mean like, yeah, he's not absolutely. saying that but that's kind of what is happening right? a lot of this stuff is intuitive once you kind of get your fingers on the pulse of how to do this you right, just do right. it intuitively um but like often when something's not working it's a often it's a tonal issue and it's because like you've got this really bad like crude joke and you're 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 like making a mighty ducks and you've got this like overt sexual crude joke that doesn't work. So they're like, that's a nine. You got to cut the nine or we'll like make it goofy and, and on a kid's level back to the four, you know? So I see it all the time <laughs> because I read amateur scripts five days a week. Bingo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of bingo, which is, you know, 
<laughs> when you hit, when you win. We can talk about Bloodsport now, the man who never misses, right? Yeah. Yeah. This section of the movie, so so like, you know, I don't I, I didn't have a lot to pull out to contribute to this episode. So this is my book report section. Mm-hmm. Um the uh this is my Jamie, it's funny, where the movie started losing you is actually like my favorite part of the whole movie. This little <laughs> yes. this little blood sport mini movie right here. That's, you, you, I, you know, it's real it's really not this part that started to lose me. It was gotcha. it was the next part. It was when they gotcha. started on the mission and it was just kind of like, yeah, they're in the jungle walking around. It started yeah. I started to drift. But that has the bit. dick conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it, it has some great stuff in it. It yeah. has some great stuff, but it was just a little um unfocused. But anyway, I think we're gonna find. I think we're gonna discuss why that is. We will. We will. Yeah, we will. Um, we will. We're gonna we're gonna figure it out. Um, but uh, we've talked about this many times. Uh, out of Blake Snyder, um, Save the Cat. Mm-hmm. He he uh, suggests that when bingo. you're setting bingo, <laughs> that when you're setting up a character, um, often movies will introduce a character in their ordinary world of act one with often six things that need fixing. And these, these six things usually apply in these categories, changes in attractiveness, false beliefs or personality problems, uh, strained personal relationships, not being entrusted with responsibility or not being able to handle responsibility, being invisible, and others don't believe in you or you've given up on yourself. So this like four minute section of the movie when we meet Bloodsport. It- by, by the way, Jimmy, what book exactly is that from? <laughs> you, you always that, mention that. And I'm like, that, that's good stuff. I want to put it into my. That, that yeah. is from the, you know, 50% of the screenwriting world is loves Save the Cat. And oh, 50% no, no, is it? The- I'm not, I'm not, I'm actually not joking to get a plug. <laughs> I was gonna say, are you kidding no, right now? No, I, is that is that his first book? Is that in his first? That is book? the f- okay. first book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, it's it's, it's it, funny because I, not... I wanted to reference it. It's it's <laughs> it was a it was a legitimate question. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, in that little five minute section where we meet, it's really like three minutes where we meet Bloodsport. It so efficiently gives us all of these things that need fixing to set up Bloodsport. Uh, changes in uh, in attractiveness, false beliefs, or personality problems. He believes there's no goodness left in him. Which in that argument with with his daughter, he believes there's no goodness in him. He basically says he's unworthy of love, and he says that others, including his daughter, should stay as far away from him as possible. Right. So there's number one: strained personal relationships. We see his daughter. Right. His daughter is embarrassed by him. Um, I love Not, that scene, dude. It's it's my favorite scene in the movie. <laughs> That's so good. So it's, good. Um, and it and it's so it's so it it's such great craft. Um, Number three, not being entrusted with responsibility or not being able to handle responsibility. He says, I'm not joining your goddamn suicide squad. And he's been ass over and over. So he's refusing responsibility. Um, Number four, being invisible to key people. The guy behind the desk. This doesn't even know who he is. He says, who the fuck is Bloodsport, right? So he's invisible. Um, and the other inmates, like Pete Davidson, just throws toilet paper at him. Like, here you go, champ. Uh, so even the other in- inmates are disrespectful of him, and he's, like, invisible to them, too. So you get the idea that he's just kind of keeping his head down and, like, you know, lost. Um, number five, others don't believe in you or you've given up on yourself. He point blank says, she says, Waller says to him, everything in your so psychological profile tells me you have what it takes to be a leader. And he screams, I am no fucking leader. So he doesn't believe in himself. So right in those three minutes, we get all the six things that need fixing right there. And, uh, that leads me into my next thing, which is the construction of the team. And I love this. There's like this meta line from Waller, she says, each member of the team is chosen for their unique abilities. And as a screenwriter, that is exactly what you need to do, their unique abilities to change your character, right? And uh, I think where this movie shines for me is uh, the internal tension, like the tension on the team. Every scene is just laden with conflict in, in between each character. And that's because 
all of we haven't really talked about this guys i don't think we've talked about like reflections of your character like when you're kind of we have i don't remember what episode okay i I couldn't tell you but we have mentioned it so so when you're when you're trying to like construct your character right so we have we just learned the the six things that need fixing right so the then once you figure out what those things are that need fixing then the, the best way to kind of explore that is to make the character be forced with people, places, and things that express those things that need fixing, right? So this team is like perfectly constructed, like from a screenwriting standpoint, to make him like feel things about all of his problems. Right, right. We have Peacemaker. He has the exact same backstory <laughs> as Bloodsport. He has the exact same powers as Bloodsport. And he even has the same personality as Bloodsport. Um, except, so he, he, except he has pride. He has, he, 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 like, he has confidence and pride. Where he, yeah. yeah. He's, and, and he's like your classic negative self-reflection. Like if, right. if, if Bloodsport does all the wrong things and makes all the wrong choices, he is Peacemaker. Right. Um, so and there vice you go. versa, right? Vice versa, right? right. If, yeah. if Peacemaker makes all the right choices, he is Bloodsport. Um, so, and then you have Polka Dot Man, Abner. Uh, he had an unhealthy, unloving relationship with his mother, just like uh, Bloodsport has an unhealthy, unloving relationship with his daughter and had an unhealthy, unloving relationship with his father. So there's another character who's like constantly going to remind blood sport about his own inner problems and things that need fixing then you have cleo the rat catcher too who had a healthy loving relationship with her father and adores him and and uh loves people places and things who others have deemed unlovable which is like everything that blood sport is trying to deal with with his inner turmoil so cleo is like another perfect person to make blood sport constantly confront the things that need fixing within him. Right. And then you have Sebastian the rat who just wants to be loved, even though everybody thinks he's disgusting and unworthy of love, except for Cleo. So once again, Bloodsport doesn't think he's worthy of love. So what do you do? You make him force with this creature who just wants him to love him. Um, and then that he innately hates and then he, because of his dad's <laughs> abuse. Right, right, right. right. Um, and then King Shark is exactly the same. He's like a threatening creature who just wants to love be loved and accepted but also wants to eat um and despite everyone fearing him so the team is like perfectly constructed for their unique abilities as waller says to change blood sport and make him grow and it's a great uh instructive example on how to create a group of characters that are different reflections of of your hero's problems so I just I thought the craft there and the team is the strength of the movie. Like the movie works. So, what what what's great about the movie is all built around that character construction. For it's me, like, it's it's a classic team up dichotomy writ large. Yes. You know, like like uh, when you have a buddy cop movie, you need to have them be the odd couple or else it doesn't work. The yin and the yang. Right. 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 And it's like always the care. What is the watch? Char- watch uh, Hobbs and Shaw. That's the problem with that movie. They're I like that movie, but they're both the same human being, and that's the problem, you know. But if you watch a great buddy cop movie like Forty Eight Hours or something, there you go. You know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. This yeah, is that's... yeah. This is where everyone's different, just in the right way. Right. They, and they, I, I didn't track each one of those things that need fixing and the various beats, but I'm sure if you watch it, just like focusing on like, uh. Uh, blood sports need to learn how to be a leader. I bet you there's three leader beats because in the end there's that great leader beat where he tells like Puka to Abner, the Captain America that's, moment. Yeah. That's your mom. Like you know that's that's him. Like he has his rise to the occasion leader moment where he like you know leads the team. I think it's directly. Yeah, Harley take the high ground. Then he tells the yeah. shark num num, and then he tells that's your mom. Yeah, like he right. And I didn't there. track that, but I bet you yeah. there's two there's two moments leading up to that where he has fails as a leader, mm-hmm. and then he finally has his success in the end as a leader. But like, it's just great craft. Um, and I, originally I wanted to talk about rule of three, but I feel like we have got so much on the list that I don't need to talk about it. Um, but if you if you watch the beats with the rat, there's 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 clear emotional beats where he's growing into a person who is trying to like no longer fear the rat and it's kind of coupled with him the rat 
she, Cleo is telling him the rat likes you because you're a good person. And he's just constantly saying like, no, I'm not a good person. There's no way this rat likes me because I have no good in me. And, and the movie does a great job giving us like three, four solid beats where we're just showing Bloodsport kind of moving through his, his inner turmoil and growing into a, into, into a better person. So it's, it's good craft. One thing while we're talking about the team, uh, there's there's this one scene, and it's almost like this has to happen this way, but there's there's a couple scenes where they have to get hero backstories out of the way, like part of the team. Mm-hmm. And the movie just kind of stops and lets them tell a story about their hero's backstory, which I think is probably, I don't really know this for sure, but maybe that's a dirty dozen kind of thing. You know what mm. I mean? Maybe they stop and do that. Some it is. Of, I can tell yeah. you it is. Yeah. Some of that stuff is where it, it's a that's a dangerous game to do. Mm-hmm. Is like you know we're we're supposed to be in the fun and games, but because we had a 13 minute intro, and we had to do the six things that needed fixing with uh, our guy Bloodsport. Now we're yeah Bloodsport, and now we have to say time out. Let's give these characters some you know five minutes, four minutes, three minutes, whatever it was to slowly tell why I think they're it, broke. I think I would go too. Like Polka Dot Man's backstory is like two minutes, literally. Yeah. Okay, two yeah, minutes. Yeah. But two still, minutes still, it is it's, it's, still two it's, minutes. It's a tight it's, it's a tight rope, right, Jamie? It's a yeah, tight yeah, rope. Tight tight rope. rope. Right. This this movie it worked really well because he just executes the hell out of it. He he does a great job. Like when you get to that point where he looks at everybody and it's his mom and they're all his mom, you know it's a great <laughs> punchline. Uh <laughs> Yeah, the it doesn't way, feel wasted. That's with that, that your happened. mom. <laughs> it's such a God. I wish I saw that in a theater with people. That's the moment I wish I saw. Exactly. So it has this great payoff when she's sitting on the train, and they show like the, the almost the movie outside the window mm-hmm. and stuff. So there's this great execution to it. So it's not like you can never do it. And obviously, there's some tropes that it harkens back to. Mm-hmm. But it is an area of danger and. And that mixed with some of the other stuff we'll talk about is I think just a little bit where I was like, where's this movie going? It's just mm-hmm. randomly throwing the stuff at me because it has to, because we're yeah. a little bit off the tracks. Mm-hmm. Could you, could you argue, like, I know Jimmy, you said, you know, it's a mess, but like, we haven't gotten into why I think I know, I know, but um, like yep. stuff like what Jamie, you just talked about right there, like on paper, that doesn't look good like stopping the movie for somebody to tell their backstory but the the actual filmmaking which we're not supposed to be talking about fixes it oh yeah you know what i mean it absolutely earns it yeah Yeah, the performances the 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 the, performances are yeah yeah the performances the 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 aesthetics the music all of it it all earns yeah like there's stuff that doesn't work on paper yeah we've talked about that many times yeah Yeah. there's a lesser movie you know that I write you know, <laughs> that that doesn't have the big payoff with everybody looking like the mom or it doesn't have the movie playing outside the window. And it's just somebody giving a speech like my dad, you know, he loved me a lot and he used to be a rat guy and blah, blah, blah. And that version is a big turd on the page. <laughs> Maybe this version's even a turd on the page when you read it. I don't know. You know, cause when you start saying, and and images project outside the window when she talks. It's not that thrilling to read. You know, mm. you're like, oh, get to it. What's this about? Yeah. When's this something going to happen? When's it going to? But right. yes, it, it works really well. And it's funny because when I rewatch this movie, I really like those scenes. Like, mm-hmm. there's some of my favorite scenes when I rewatch yeah. this movie. Where so. the movie just slows down to Spiderweb, essentially, into a yeah. different but movie, like you said. It's, um, it's just a it is a dangerous game that he played well and screenwriting can sometimes be a dangerous game. Mm-hmm. So uh, just wade into that territory. I, yeah. It, so it, it's, it's go ahead. Go ahead, Bob. Sure. Oh, I wanted to say too, about this, the whole stopping and them talking about their backstory in a weird way, the way this read to me is it's a movie where all the protagonists are actually antagonists in their own stories. Cause they're all villains mm-hmm. and they're all like kind of stopping to give their own praise of killer speeches a little bit. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, what like they, what that. you know, what they, what they yeah, can do. Yeah, it's like yeah. he's treating them like villains, even though they're the good guys in, in the story. That's true. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. there's a there's a old rule about exposition. And I, I've never really liked this rule because in some ways 
I think there's better ways to fix it, but it was like, how do you make exposition good? And the, and the answer I used to hear is if you can deliver something that the audience wants to hear at that point, that's how yeah. you make exposition good. So if, and, and in both of those cases, you know, why the, you know, what the hell is a polka dot man? Where does that come and from? And what's, what's yeah. on his face? Why what's does on he his look, face? What is happening? this? We've yeah. been desiring answers to those questions we, right. for a half an hour. Yeah. Right yeah. So, so there's kind of an audience surrogate there. Like, you know, what, what mm -hmm. the hell is a polka dot man? And he, mm -hmm. he tells you so, yeah. and it's fun. And the answer is cool. Yeah. Rat catcher two is a question. Well, yeah. what's rat catcher one, you know, tell yeah. me about rat catcher one. What's the deal yeah. with rat catcher one? How did you become rat catcher two? Yeah. So, these are some techniques that it, old, old techniques that if you need to deliver exposition like that, it's important to set up something going forward, which in both of these cases, I mean, Ratcatcher 2 is the central theme of this movie when yeah. in the end, she's giving, she, you know, she says it right there. She says, I want to give to you what my father gave to me. Um, and that's what she does there on the roof in the end or whatever mm -hmm. she gives she, to him. She embraces love. him like, yeah, like her father yeah. did. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's critical to the whole thing. And when I said that the end of the movie was so good that it made me like the whole movie more, mm -hmm. um, I was like all on board. I was like a little shaky. And then when we got to the end, I was like, wow, they paid all this stuff off and it's awesome. Third acts are um, important, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it totally sold me on the movie. Like I was, I probably would have ended up more in Jimmy territory, but when, after I saw I mean, the third act, I went back and liked the whole thing much better. Do you remember right. the first act of Avengers? <laughs> like yeah. i mean it's okay but it's not the, I, I mean the third i do act remember everybody. i do remember really boring loki steals the cube scene right like, that's what i'm saying is avengers was i mean it's it's a great movie we all love right. it we did an episode on it the yeah. first act though does not sell me on that movie right, right. <laughs> at all but that third act who boy um, yeah there's not many third acts like that third act yeah yeah um yeah, that's a great note. And and everything yeah. you're saying, Jamie, like all of that ex, ex, exposition ends up being really consequential mm -hmm. to like, if you don't have it. It's then, essential to, the, to yeah. the whole movie. And I think that's really instructive that it's it's not uh, superfluous. It's very consequential. Yes, um, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a weird movie because the knee jerk reaction would be to say that's bad screenwriting. Mm -hmm. But those things are essential to a great that great movie that great payoff mm -hmm. that i love so much and there's really not you know he's being very uh judicious about where he puts things because he wanted that cool 13 mm -hmm. minute opening that is sort of a fake out you know so he has yeah. to be really because there's another way you do this movie where each of the team members comes and you kind of get their they get their it. little vignette Maybe, right. maybe you and, get a video screen, Ratcatcher yeah. 2, and this and that, and blah, 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 yeah, and they yeah, meet yeah. each other. Or they're on the airplane and they're talking, like like mm -hmm. in the opening sequence. Kind of like Deadpool 2, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. There are other ways to do it, but because of the choices he made in the beginning of this movie, he kind of has to do it kind of on the move, on its feet, and put it in action sequences. And these are the type of things that when you decide to do something wacky, like the opening 13 minutes, you know, fake out. These are the type of decision. This is what that impacts. This mm -hmm. is the thing that you have to figure out later. And he did figure it out. So it's not like it can't be figured out, but it's, it's honestly, when you decide to do something weird, it usually has weird ripple effects. Mm -hmm. It means you have to do cool, weird stuff later. And that, that's, <laughs> you could take that as a challenge or you could take that as a problem. And I think, James Gunn shows you it can just be a challenge and you can rise above it. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be a problem. And I'm sure <laughs> Jimmy has seen it a few times. Yes. Well. Also, yes. uh, I was going to say, uh, Jimmy, you said something to both of us uh, offline where you said a lot of the stuff in the script is don't do this unless you're James Gunn, <laughs> which, right. is, which is like a Tarantino thing or like a, yeah, you know, any, yeah. Like he has the license to. Dude, well, he's just got the, he's got, he's got the, the he's got the, the, the talent and the, talent the voice the license to do it, right? What what you guys are saying is, if you're just starting out, don't leap into being James Gunn right away. <laughs> like he, like James Gunn could make the normal movie first. Yes. You know what I mean? He's yeah. totally capable of that, but he's twisting what he knows, right? Yep, yep. He's subverting it. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I feel like our, our Tarantino, our Pulp Fiction episode, we talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Like certain people have license to break rules and the and audience the, will And the talent. The talent. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I'm saying that the talent gave them the license to do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, a terrible transition, but I don't have a transition <laughs> here. Uh, Golden Fleet. This is a mouthful. Golden Fleet. Yeah. We yeah, kind of not, talked about episodicness, didn't we? We did, we did, and I it it kind of runs into this. It's it's again kind of the so this is a golden flea story, a golden flea story again, a Blake Snyder bingo, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Blake Snyder thing. Uh, his Blake Snyder's genres, there there he has a list of ten uh, common patterns: uh, buddy love, monster in the house, golden fleece being one of them. And a golden fleece is your quest story or road trip story. Uh, it's something where a team of people have to go, you know, traverse a road to get some obstacle, do something, win a championship. There's many different Lord of the Rings, right? Lord of the Rings is one, but also Major League could be one. As ah, one. that's a good example. There. Nice. Uh, so there's all different kinds, uh, all different kinds of quest stories but lord of the rings is an excellent example and closer to this one mission movies um heist movies as well so oceans oceans 11 would be a, a good example of a golden fleece as well um here's the problem with golden fleeces and it, it this more shows up in like road trip movies like um i don't know little miss sunshine or something dumb and dumber D dumb and dumber uh wild hogs <laughs> the reason i'll say wild hogs is a wild hogs reference every wild. all of our listeners love wild hogs and, know it by heart, so. and, and, and the reason i list wild hogs is because i want to show like the bad version of this it used to be like when when i was a kid there were a lot of these road trip movies and everyone had like the rough country bar or you know what i mean or something like that would be the thing they get pulled over by a cop they get this and they were a list of things and they could happen in any random order, depending on when wild hogs kind of does that. If you ever watch, if anybody ever watches wild hogs, um, I have it, seen it. <laughs> yeah. It kind, of, it kind of just has the random checklist of generic road trip things and Genre just, expectations. Yeah. yeah. And they just kind of happen. Um, what about vacation? Va vacation probably falls into the randomness a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think they all do. I think they all have a little element of randomness and that's the weird thing about it because sometimes those movies can get a little um i, I don't want to say boring but the they meander like, they meander yeah, they meander because they can go anywhere yeah. and you're that's like, what i'm and, gonna get and, into about the and this movie when i say it lost me a little this is the part where it lost me so when they when they land on the thing and they start going there's some great scenes that keep getting my attention like like I said, one of my favorite scenes was when they were shooting the freedom fighters and didn't know. Um, to me, that just cracked me up. Um, but they can kind of meander, and I don't know where they're going, or or I don't see the progression. It just seems like, eh, you know, and, and that's the problem with that can happen with Golden Fleece movies. And I think this movie does a pretty good job of having a this happens, so this happens, because like that scene happens, so then they meet Flag, Mm -hmm. And then he has information for the next thing. So it does a pretty good job of the craft of it, but it's just the danger of these movies. They can get a little lost of like, what is this movie I'm watching? Or, and some movies have like um, somebody's chasing them or ticking mm -hmm. clock is, is closing in. Like they only have so much time. And these are the ways you can kind of put a little focus on these movies. And um, they do that, you know, it yeah. changes to a rescue mission for, right. It, it does, you know, yeah. it's a kidnap mission, but then it changes to a rescue Randall flag and then it changes back to kidnap a thinker. And so they definitely do that. And I do think that everything is consequential. That's not a complaint of mine. It's just that, like you said, it, 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 there's some meandering about I mean, well, just the talking. just the mere fact that they say, but first we have to save uh, Harley. You know, I mean, yeah, that yeah. shows you it's like, <laughs> oh, well, once you know again, what, the though, first... the craft of that moment is also awesome. Like, yeah, yeah. So, know, it's a, like, so it works. Yeah, it, it works. works. He like, yeah. makes it work. It shows yeah. you the danger of it because they could then say, but first we have to make a Starbucks run. And it's yeah. like, okay. Well, it's it's you just a, it's a it's a symptom of it not having a deadline. 
Right, uh, right. There's and there's so, usually yeah. some kind of tension. Can we that's talk closing. about that, or we don't? You don't want to? Yeah, because I have a, I have sort of, I have, I want to hear what you have to say, but I have sort of an interesting thought about that. Well, okay. I just, I wanted to kind of one more thing before we get into it, Jamie. I wanted okay. to, pick, okay. I wanted to piggyback off of your multiple, unless this was Bob's note, whoever wrote it. Okay, I this, wanted to piggyback off of the multiple fun and game segments. Yeah, I wrote that. Okay, okay. Jamie, okay. you've said so, you've said something in the past when we've talked about. Blake Snyder, bingo. <laughs> no, Five, the, we're never going to live this. Jesus down Christ! <laughs> well, the, the <laughs> funny games is Blake Snyder, so we're well, we're in deep. We're in deep. We're in deep. <laughs> the five point finale, right? Often in a in in a in a in a cheeseburger movie, which is what we talk about mostly on this show. Um, your arc plot commercial movie going experience. MCU, when you get, the MCU, the yeah, MCU. Yeah. Uh, when you get to the climax, there is like. You, it usually follows a pattern of a five point finale gathering the team, storming the castle, the high tower surprise, the dig down deep, and then the execution of the new plan. And Jamie, you've said in the past, uh, one way to make your scenes or sequences interesting is just to, the whole thing could just be the five point finale from start to finish, from scene to scene, just cut right to it. And I feel like every sequence in this movie is just a five point finale a gathering the team a storming the castle a high tower surprise to dig down deep and an executing of the new plan i feel like you could take every sequence in this movie and just you know break it down as if it's the last 20 minutes of a movie and it would it would it would track it tracks man <laughs> god <laughs> it's, i think that's also why to me at least it feels extremely dense yeah, yeah, it's uh, super. Like, it's extremely it's, eventful. It's, yeah, I mean, it's there why, is... and and speaking of that, before we get into the one thing that Bob wants to get into as well, <laughs> uh, because well, he wrote it down. I was, just I saying, did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because... It's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but one more thing, I forgot to mention. I I did want to mention those tit- title cards because what they reminded me of, and and this is the dense thing because like again, I say each. Each one of those titles or sequences feels like its own comic book, its own story. Like I could read that that, that issue and be like, wow, that was a good issue. I'll wait till next month. And it continues the story, but I get another issue. And the, the, the title cards reminded me, you know, we've talked about the sequence method before. And for fans of this movie, maybe this is a quick handle that might help you outline. So that's why I wanted to use this as like a little example of title cards. I think what you could do, like, let's say you're a James Gunn and you're just coming up with this movie and you're breaking the story and you had all these ideas in your head. You could literally just sit down and say, what are the eight chapters, the chapter titles of my movie? And then, you know, you have all this chaos in your head, just write down the chapter titles, you know, just write down eight and eight's kind of a magic number. And when we talk about the sequence method or the mini movie method, which is out there, you can Google it. We've talked about it before which basically breaks a movie into eight like mini movies. That's kind of when I saw that and I saw these mm-hmm. titles. I don't know that he had eight. I think he might have had seven. Yeah, it's, it's less, but yeah. still. But he didn't have one in the opening. So I think if you add one or if something. If you had the yeah. actual title card. If you put a title card, yeah, on that yeah, opening yeah. sequence. If, if that was yeah. like the Suicide Squad or something and then yeah, the rest. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it generally breaks down into eight. I thought I wrote them down, but I guess I don't have Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's close to eight. It's close yeah. to eight. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And they're yeah. all about 10 minutes a piece. So it's like, yeah. So I, I, 20, uh, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. 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 I guess I didn't write them down. But anyway, Damn do, it, do, you think, do you guys think that like, James Gunn actually is doing that consciously at this point? Uh, I, he's probably, maybe, it's probably but, intuitive to him. I mean, who knows yeah. what his process is? And maybe his right. process is out there. Maybe he puts it out there. <laughs> maybe he's about. actually has eight pieces of paper and he's like, yeah, I, yeah, I, don't know. I more wanted to use it as a instructive brain. If you like this movie and you like that title card thing, maybe if you have a movie idea in your own head, just go right now and sit down and write your cool eight title, eight cards. title cards that they're going to make your whole movie. And, and guess what? You're probably 50% to an outline. If you do yep, that, you right know? there, you yeah, know, right there, just with eight title cards. It's a good way to start. I do that sometimes, sometimes yeah, when I'm on a brand new idea, I just write, what are the eight chapters? And I'll literally just title them. Like it'll be, if, if I was doing, let's do a star Wars reference. Cause that's a bingo. Um, <laughs> oh, they're coming with the villains plan. They're coming hard. Yes. So if, if you were doing star Wars, you know, the opening might be, um, 
uh, escape, <laughs> escape the Death Star, or I'm sorry, escape Darth Vader or something. Yeah, like yeah. The, the opening sequence, and then it might be um, droids on Tatooine or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, and you might do some, and you might just go down and write them out like that. And you'll, and by the end, you know, uh, eight's probably going to be destroy the Death Star, and then so you mm -hmm. have eight. And then you can just fill in the middle. But anyway, it's a great way to start an outline. It's a simple way, and you can do it in like ten seconds, and that's yeah. why I like to do it. This yeah, is same. that's my it's my favorite piece of advice, uh, Jimmy, you've ever given me. It's for writing. Like when you told me it was years ago before this podcast, where you're like, just make eight short films that have to do with each other in sequence. Yeah, and they're and I was all. Like, why did yeah. I ever think of it like that? They yeah, all bring like, the hero closer, or sometimes it's a big step back. You know, yeah. closer or big step back to answering the big overall right. story question. Yeah. And then, and then we've coined some kind of weird save the cat corollary. So you come up with your eight title cards and then you do five step finales for each one and then you're done. Yeah. And there then it's it. Yeah. <laughs> um, you just anyway. do all that. Then you quit it's and then that, you never make the movie. You it's that out. easy. It's that easy. <laughs> make, cast the check. <laughs> um, all right. Bring so, on the Star Wars references now. <laughs> God. <laughs> Uh, well, so I'm sorry. I'm lost now. Uh, we're on project starfish, a hero and villains plan without a doomsday clock. I feel like yes, that's where we are, right? That's where we are. So you wrote that Jimmy. Yes. Yeah. So, so, okay. Like wonder woman, 1984, which I felt very similar problems as I was experiencing this movie for the first time. Um, I did like it a lot more on the second time, by the way. Um, you mean Wonder Woman or this? This. Oh. Um, the my concern that the reason I think it meanders and feels like a messy meandering experience is simple, and that is there's no deadline for the hero for the for the hero and villain's plan. There's it's, it's two two things. Number one, we're kept in the dark about what the villain's plan is for a large portion of this movie, and even when we're finally told. And I want to talk about that with you guys and see what you feel about it and whether you agree or whether I'm just wrong, being too harsh. But for me, the emotional like disengagement of mm -hmm. everything that's happening is because I don't know why the mission is important for about 45 minutes. And then even once we're told what it is, it's vague. So here, here, here we in 23 minutes, she says, uh, this this is potentially she being who I mean Wall, Waller. Waller. Okay. She's presenting it to Bloodsport. Twenty three minutes in, she says it's in it's potentially cataclysmic for Americans and the world. Your mission is to infiltrate jo Jotunheim and destroy every trace of Project Star Starfish. Okay, what does that mean? What is potentially cataclysmic for Americans in the world? It's just like a really vague statement, right? So we're just supposed to it's like... A, it's a need-to-know mission. I'm not saying that makes it better, but it is a need-to-know for them. You know what I mean? Like, Yeah, so I'm going to... Yeah, no, exactly. So, And since right now they're keeping us... It's a perspective thing. They're keeping right, right. us aligned with blood sports perspective. They're not giving us superior position. So we only know what they know. Mm -hmm. And since blood sport and the team don't ask more because Amanda Waller knows, but they don't even ask well, what is, what is this? Um, they just ask if it has anything to do with buttholes, which is fine. It's funny, but it's not, it doesn't help me feel anything about the mission. So then 38 minutes have gone by and they rescue, you know, they kill all the freedom fighters by accident, trying to, trying to rescue randall flag and randall flag says it's to the freedom fighter <laughs> <laughs> Fre freedom the randall flag gives us an update about the mission the audience to, to try to remind us as an audience why we should care mm -hmm. why this is so important and he says right now our objective is aligned with yours jotunheim contains technology that could be used on the people of corto maltese as well as americans that's why we need your help okay again what the fuck does that mean? Like, why am I, how am I as an audience member supposed to be like, oh my God, it contains technology that might hurt Americans. Well, gee, let's fucking get it. Um, so we're 38 minutes in and we still don't even know what it is they're doing or why we have just vague information. Then when they finally show us, so it's a couple minutes later, 40 minutes, we're given superior position. And this is what I want to talk to you guys about. Mm -hmm. 
he goes ahead, James Gunn goes ahead and gives us superior position. So we're learning shit that the team doesn't know. Um, and he's showing us this, this, this like archival video of like the starfish, the starfish and like, yeah. and like just kind of like infecting a couple, a couple astronauts. Right. So we're kind of getting an idea here of what could happen, but it's really not a visualization of like what the grand master stakes are. Like it's not, the Death Star blowing up a planet. It's just like two astronauts getting like face hugged, essentially, like from aliens. And uh, the thinker says it makes extensions of itself. They take hosts, it feeds on their consciousness and grows larger. And then the general says, the rumors of this beast are true. We can unleash the creature in the US and then it will destroy them all. And this is my, this is my like sticking point. The El Presidente says, no, not yet. He says, with such a dangerous weapon, the world will take us seriously. So right there, they have no plans to use it anytime soon. There's no imminent villain's plan to use this, this monster threat. So there's no deadline. It's, there's no doomsday clock. It's just like one day, eventually down the road, when this movie, maybe even after this movie is over, the villains might use this monster, right? And so I think that choice is what leads this to a meandering experience. Cause like, if they were like, no, we're gonna use it on America or even their own people like right now, then all of a sudden we go like, oh God, like the Suicide Squad has to stop them or else the whole Corto Maltese population is gonna be, that ending that we, that we see that amazing third act, uh, we're not told that they're trying to stop that from happening. Like that's not, an, that's not part of their plan anytime soon is, mm -hmm. is my problem um and i and i and it isn't until 86 minutes that we really see what we're supposed the outcome we're supposed to be fearing when the whole team learns what we know but to an extreme 86 minutes in we see all the pay all the people victimized and like a legion of people i feel like if we saw that i'm totally rewriting the movie here but i feel like if we saw that 20 minutes in if we got the superior position and got instead of keeping it a mystery and we were put in that lab and saw like hundreds of people under control of that giant monster and understood like oh shit this is what the, the whole movie is about stopping this i feel like the whole movie changes and all of a sudden it's super urgent it never meanders because we're like they're taking their time and they need to, they need to like get their shit moving. You know what I mean? And so that for me, that's the only, that's my reason why I feel like this movie meanders because there's no doomsday clock for any of that stuff to happen. It's just sort of there. It's, that, that's, that's really my only problem. Yeah. I, um, I'm not disagreeing with you. I actually agree with you on that. It doesn't bother me, my <laughs> enjoyment of it at all. Yeah. But for this, for our purposes here, I totally agree with you. I was going to say too, like, there if i had to criticize something is that there's actually there's two i mean there's two essential plots going on right there's the starfish plot and then there's amanda waller protecting america's interest plot right? america's interest plot right Which, yeah yeah like if i had to criticize something about the script i think it would be we I, I don't, i'm rewriting sorry yeah we need a we needed a moment alone with amanda waller and someone else with her saying it's she is fearing the imminent breakdown of that right. country and the freedom fighters and the government and the information getting out. And that's for her. There's a ticking clock of this is all about to right. crumble. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm sending in this team. That is right. not. I think that's absolutely happening. And if you watch mm -hmm. the movie enough, it reads, but it does not read on the surface very well at all. Right. You can't gather. But it's yeah. it, it is there. But it, that is that plot line that is there I, is not expressed properly i i think it kind of comes down to story dna like if we if we mapped out this log line hero goal obstacle stakes mm -hmm. um a team of people have to go destroy a secret project um against you know a huge army of blah 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 that's protecting it so we get to the part with stakes right what are the stakes and and the stakes are the reason why this has to happen right now. And that's the part I would have a hard time with the log line, you know, knowing mm -hmm. from the break into two. I think with, with what Bob says, like to rewrite the script or something, you probably put something in where Amanda Waller is like, 
um, like you said, that this country is about the breakdown and uh, they have this our has to happen. Right. This has to happen within 24 hours or whatever. It's and, so simple. And if you don't, I will kill you, you know, or I'll send your uh, daughter to prison or whatever the thing is. You know, you all die. You know, in 24 hours, you will die. If I was going to, that was going to be my argument um, to yeah. Jimmy, is where I was going to say that there isn't a ticking clock like you're saying, but for the, our characters that we're in love with, Mm -hmm. there is yeah there's there is there's a bomb them. in their head and there's a bomb to, in their head they, i don't but think they they don't, un they don't understand what's happening even but they they're not sometimes. given a they're not given a deadline though like no they're but not. um i think the fact that there is a bomb inside of their heads which we are yeah. shown at the beginning of the movie yeah it doesn't the push is enough of that where we're, they're, they're just moving forward no matter what yeah for no, the audience to be like they, even if this doesn't make any sense a fucking starfish you got to just go with it because yeah. your head can explode at any moment yeah and they, that's they sort of the ticking back. clock yeah you can't there's no they, turning back so it's not a ticking clock but it's a forward. bomb no, under the table the still. personal stakes for the team is absolutely absolutely there, there. and right. i feel and i feel that i'm just saying as an audience yeah. no i got you like i don't understand it took me it was 40 minutes before it was clarified mm -hmm. what the fuck it was that that they were doing um and that's a very long time to like I, keep yeah it's a puzzle yeah. piece that could have made the movie slightly more engaging i agree yeah yeah, yeah. and I, I, I i'm just pointing to the meandering aspect of it because if they because like it if they didn't have time to to hang out i like them hanging out at the strip club and and bonding as a team at the strip club and having fun but that is a symptom of them not having a deadline like right if it's, they if they, if there was more urgency yep. that scene can't happen and so i understand the choices that were made but i feel like that's why the movie me is constantly pausing to get all this like character moments because they don't need to rush mm -hmm. like they can just kind of hang out and then eventually they'll get there and they'll get the job done and so that, that to me is why i feel like this movie meanders is all i'm saying it um, it it that washes away a bit with rewatches. You said you liked it more the second. Yeah, time. well, the third act is so yeah, good. Yeah, it does. It um, washes away a bit. And 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 I just like I feel like the third act is pay the the mo Starro and what Starro does is not really doesn't become set up until like an hour into the yeah movie. yeah. So you're sort of just watching like the climax of. And hours of movie. Well, I would say yeah. Bloodsport like, killing or Bloodsport taking down Peacemaker is the ending of one movie. Yes, and so, and, so I, yeah. I guess I just feel like with one tweak, which the, he made the choice that we were going to have superior position mm -hmm. and see all this stuff that the characters aren't. With one tweak, we would have had that superior position twenty minutes earlier, and the movie's like super fucking like has like this engine that's like like bruh, like just you know moving that. I don't feel I, 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 I could easily have paused this movie, come back in, pause this movie and got the exact same experience. Like you said, Jamie, of the flipping of the comic to the next chapter in the trade paperback. It, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Uh, if it was a, tele, um, if it was a television yeah. series, like it was a television series, each of those individual episodes have their own urgency, you know? So you'd be yes, okay. And with they do. It. Like, and you feel that. Yeah. That's absolutely. But as a movie, it doesn't, it doesn't have that, through line that urges. momentum is not there for me at all um i think it's like super chill it's like i don't think this I, is a thrill ride in the slightest for me it was like hey we're hanging out with some really fun people and it's very interesting and entertaining and exciting and here's another 10 minutes where we're hanging out with the other these people and it's entertaining and exciting but like i'm not like we have to get to the star o and stop the, the I, big <laughs> i i feel like also if i me i'm defending it now but I feel like I, it's just, I, it's more of a character movie than it's a plot yeah. movie. No, I but mean, to be honest, with no, you, I know. It just is. No, like, I know, but I, it's it, it it's commute. It's it's a, it's acting like it's a plot movie is what I'm. It's using plot devices. It's using all these techniques. Right. You know, it's giving us this, the the goal stakes reward obstacles urgency updates. We our our interests are aligned. We have to get into the city to stop the thing. But then it's only giving us like half I, the equation. And, I still and, feel like the head bomb things is enough for people. For yeah. I think that I, th like, I think the it reviews goes a long reflect way. that. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Like I, I feel like it reads to people the urgency just from that. I I think. Well, it, I, I'm not. Way. You're right, but also like. 
Who cares? <laughs> their, their heads can blow up at any moment, dude. Who, who like, cares? Yeah, like they're 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 in imminent danger the entire time they're on screen. I guess There's, I guess I'm such an escape from New York fan. I'm like, I mean, the head bomb. Okay, that's fine. I'm not really worried about any of their heads right. exploding because I'm. It's not going to happen. I, um, I, I, I think it goes well, a long I mean, way. She did blow somebody's head up. <laughs> right? it, it does help me to understand, like, when I start losing track of the movie. You know what I mean? Like, when I'm starting, mm-hmm. like, eh, anything can happen or whatever. And I think it's very instructive for people writing screenplays. That's why I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. That's literally the only reason yeah, I, I'm saying. It would not be used as a lesson. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, another, it's another one of these mo- things in this movie that That's works all. fine, and it shows you that you could get away with it if you make an awesome, if you're James Gunn and make an awesome movie. Um, well, why, but why leave it out? But yeah, when you're, when you're doing your outline and you think about these things, this might be something to think about. That urgency, that he, why did they have to keep moving? Why, why did it, you know. Yeah. James Gunn might even reasons. agree with your criticism there. He might even be like. <laughs> I'm, might sorry. Even be, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. No. I know you're a fucking master. He could. Um, no, no, but I'm saying he might go, he might go, you know what? Slip my mind. I didn't or, think of. I don't it. care. I got yeah. this shark tearing yeah. people in half. Yeah, what is the fucking? Who gives a shit? <laughs> he could. He could say we had this scene that did exactly that, but we cut it out. I well, mean, yeah, and that's true. And and we always say this. I try to repeat this on the podcast. Like that might be in the script. They might have yeah. shot it, and so, they were just like, you know what? We don't need this. I I heard him say something similar about why flag was uh, on the first mission and not the second, and they had like this cutaway scene where he made fun of amanda waller's shirt <laughs> like he, he made a joke yeah, and she yeah, just glared yeah. at him or something and that's why <laughs> um, spe- speaking also of- he didn't even he didn't even explain why rick flag i mean they kind of if you unless you're assuming the first movie doesn't happen is it is that rick flag's not rick a villain flag? i'm calling him randall, randall flag. That's, flag that's yeah. the guy from that's the, the stand the right yeah. oh i keep calling him randall flag yeah, and that's flag. the stand but <laughs> the stand. in in the context of this movie Shit, if you remove the first movie even rick as flag, an R. rick flag's not a villain why is he in this team at all <laughs> like, like i it's fine i don't yeah. care but he is not he is decidedly different than the rest of them mm-hmm. and it, it, it's not explained but whatever yeah the, the, the other thing i heard in a, in a James gun <laughs> interview was that did you hear who the original villain he had slotted in for this movie no, was i didn't it was superman Oh yes, no, I did. Re- yeah. Whoa, that's yeah. awesome! Interesting. I don't, I don't quite know how if it fit any. I don't think here. you would have had the same plot at all. Though. Red kryptonite. I I, um, <laughs> what's that? A red sun? Red kryptonite. A red kryptonite. A red kryptonite story. Um, I don't know. I don't know what. It, it's know one of those story. things where, like, curious. You question, you know? Yes, Bloodsport shot him with a kryptonite bullet, but I'm also like, I, that movie's a lot harder to write. Yes. When yeah. you added Superman. Oh, yeah. You know, like, what does is, what is Harley Quinn do with Superman? She's a person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like... Yeah. Oh, but I wanted to... I wanted to say on the positive of the urgency. Mm-hmm. Um, I think this is another... Another instructive aspect of the crafting of this movie is that this uses non-linear, non-linear structure in a way that's really great because it i think that it meanders you broke up a little bit there jimmy it knows that if it told the story linearly it repeat hey jimmy repeat yourself okay a little bit okay i think the story (laughs) bingo (laughs) can you hear me now yeah 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 (laughs) oh god i think the story okay so i'll start from the beginning I, I I think there's more another great craft instructive aspect of the craft of this movie screenwriting wise is its use of nonlinear structure. A lot of times when people use nonlinear structure, they use it just to be cool and just to like, you know, make it interesting and 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 like th- reverse expectation from the audience. Here, I think that they understand that it's meandering. And the that if it was told linearly, it would really feel like it meandering. Like imagine if we start with blood sport and then we take 20 minutes to get to the island, that opening sequence, it, that movie is very slow building and and not the same experience. It doesn't start off with a bang and 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 deliver those genre expectations right off the start. So I think this is a great example of how to use nonlinear structure in an impactful way like it's emotionally impactful and they do it he does it four times we get the 
we say three days ago after we get to the prologue and then they catch us back up to where we met Bloodsport and the team. And then right before Peacemaker is about to kill Ratcatcher, it cuts to eight minutes earlier and shows us the whole story of them detonating the building because it understands that if it had told all that linearly, the, the pace and the urgency and the momentum wouldn't feel right and it would be kind of like meandering. And so I think this is a great example of when to use nonlinear structure. That's all. I was, I was, I'm giving it applause. It also, it also I think, it. I don't know. It, it makes it feel like the audience is in on something. I don't mm-hmm. know how to. I don't know how to word this. It, it, it makes you. It, it engages the audience more because now they have to put a piece of the puzzle together. Mm-hmm. As in, like, okay, so that's where we were. We're eight minutes back, and now. Yeah, Let's yeah, you have to back really to yeah, sink like, your teeth into what's happening. It, it kind of brings you in. It's like, we're going to try a fun game, everybody. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, here's yeah. what happens. I yeah. think it's really impactful. I really like it. It's yeah. like one of my favorite things about this movie. I'm not a fan of just like casual use of nonlinear structure, but I think here it's really, really well done. I um, That was, that was I what I wanted like to say. We, the stuff that we haven't directly discussed, we've actually discussed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um unless you guys have something i loud. mean we've been we talked a lot about this movie <laughs> yeah we have <laughs> yeah um yeah i think we're good unless uh, jamie you got anything jamie do you have bingo yet yeah bingo did you did I, you do i it? have i i filled three cards because <laughs> <laughs> the prize this month is a, a beautiful pink teddy bear and i'll nice. i'll mail it out to you <laughs> okay um yeah so I guess what have we learned? Mm. What did we learn from James Gunn's The Suicide Squad? Uh, I would say my favorite takeaway in this in this movie is uh, the construction of the team of really taking a hard look at all the things that need fixing from your character's construction and then making a group of supporting characters that force him to to confront all of those problems over and over and over again in different ways, different sides of him. Um, so I think the constructing of the team based on like all of blood sports, uh, things that need fixing is like the big takeaway for me in this one. Jamie. Yeah. I, I think this is a lesson I learn every time I watch James Gunn movies, but it's, Right, like you're a 12 year old kid who just walked out of the movie, like hopped up on goobers and soda, and you kind of write like it's a fever dream and you love movies and you're super excited by movies. Right, like that. Um, because I think every time I watch a James Gunn movie, that that lesson is that maybe I forget sometimes, unless you're writing Schindler's List, then maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, <laughs> If you're writing something that's supposed to be fun and popcorny or something, if you're writing something very serious that's you know needs some respect, then maybe chill out. Um, but uh, you know that that's the lesson I learned from every James Gunn movie. Yeah, for me, I was going to say the same thing almost, Jamie. It was like I think, regardless of any of the episodes we ever do on James Gunn, you could, it's hard to argue with the apparent enthusiasm on the page. Mm. Like if you don't have it, it's not going to show up, and he has it, man. It, it it bleeds through everything, even the like even without as much craft as he puts into something, I think it would still read. You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. there. Be enthusiastic about what you write. You know, love what you write, because if you don't, we're not going to love it either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think. Yeah. Oh yeah, and also like I said, I was going to say. Uh, my mom loved this movie. Like, <laughs> oh my god, I watched it for the show, and she adored it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, my extremely religious mother. <laughs> so, and for her, you know, it completely worked. She was riveted the entire time. That's so, awesome. Yeah, she wasn't like, wait a minute, there's no ticking time. <laughs> yeah, no, and most <laughs> yeah, people are most not going to give a shit. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Me over here turning my nose up. What's your mom's favorite movie, Bob? She doesn't have one, but mm-hmm. she really loves uh, action movies, and okay. she loves all. She loves like Marvel stuff. She loved Bad Boys Three so much it okay. surprised me. Like she called me the next day and was like, "Oh my god, it was so good!" And I was like, "I was not expecting 
<laughs> that kind of a response. <laughs> so you never know. You know what I mean? That's awesome. Yeah. She goes to church literally every day. She's that religious. And wow. yet, these movies speak to her. I don't a movie where like people are getting ripped apart and turned into goo. No clue. <laughs> I don't know. That's fantastic. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Um, plugs? Any you guys? Anything you want to plug? Um, no. I the only thing I have at the end of the month, and I can't remember the exact dates. It's like the last weekend of September, twenty twenty one. If you're in this time zone and not listening in the future, um, I will be doing some classes at the Story Expo that is now virtual, so people can sign up for it virtually. I don't. It's, it, I don't know how much it costs, but you get a weekend. It's basically a convention full of classes for a weekend. And I will be teaching four different ones of those. So nice. if, you're, nice. if you're interested, sign up. It's the Story Expo. Awesome, Jamie. Really cool. Uh, I'll just plug again. Um, everything that goes up on the feed also goes up on YouTube. And if you go to thundergrunt.com, there's a YouTube link there. And we have it, its own personal mirror channel. So I know some people actually do like YouTube, according to some of our uh, view counts. Metrics. So, yeah. yeah, like some episodes have actually done really well on there. So if you're into that, I'm putting them up there, too. Yeah. Uh, other than that, I think that's everything, guys. I think yeah. we did it. We uh, you know, we took a little bit of a break, but we're back. And uh, back. nice to be back. Yeah. Do you want to tease what's coming next or not? Do we know? Uh, maybe we don't. <laughs> I was gonna say I I I might have black. What 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 is it? What are we talking about? Yeah, tease it. Tease the tease thing it. that might I, be coming next. I, Tell I, me and Jamie I, what we forgot. I thought we were gonna do Candyman, the original. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. okay. That's, well, that's now cool. we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, didn't we say we do Candyman and then and then the new Candyman? The he new had the Candyman. costume. Ah, yeah. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Which we never we've, never, we've never done that. So we never done what... it two successive episodes where it was like the original, original and, and reboot. reboot. Yeah. So we've cool. done a versus, cool. but never that. I think yeah. that would be fun. That'd be cool. Yeah. 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 All right. So All now right, we have to do that. that. Now that, we have to. That's what we're doing now. So, so. Candyland, based on the board game, written by Jamie Nash. That's right, Candyland. Okay. I'd love to see that. I would watch it. Uh, okay, guys. Right. I think that's everything. Yeah. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. yeah thanks. Bingo. 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 <laughs> right, we did it. You have just listened to Writer's Blockbusters, a screenwriting podcast featuring two professionals and another guy. Available only on Thundergrunt.